Everything I Know About Love, written and read by Dolly Alderton. Everything I Knew About Love as a Teenager Romantic love is the most important and exciting thing in the entire world. If you don't have it when you're a proper grown-up, then you have failed, just like so many of my art teachers who I've noted are Miss instead of Mrs and have frizzy hair and ethnic jewellery. It's important to have a lot of sex with a lot of people, but probably no more than ten. When I'm a single woman in London, I will be extremely elegant and slim and wear black dresses and drink martinis and will only meet men at book launches and at exhibition openings. The mark of true love is when two boys get in a physical fight over you. The sweet spot is drawn blood but no one having to go to hospital. One day this will happen to me, if I'm lucky. It is important to lose your virginity after your 17th birthday, but before your 18th birthday. Literally, even if it's just the day before, that's fine, but if you go into your 18th year still a virgin, you will never have sex. You can snog as many people as you like, and that's fine. It doesn't mean anything. It's just practice. The coolest boys are always tall and Jewish and have a car. Older boys are the best kind because they're more sophisticated and worldly and also they have slightly less stringent standards. When friends have boyfriends, they become boring. A friend having a boyfriend is only ever fun if you have a boyfriend too. If you don't ask your friend about their boyfriend at all, they'll eventually get the hint that you find it boring and they'll stop going on about him. It's a good idea to get married a bit later in life and after you've lived a bit, say 27. Farley and I will never fancy the same boy because she likes them short and cheeky like Nigel Harmon and I like them macho and mysterious like Charlie Simpson from Busted. This is why our friendship will last forever. No moment in my life will ever be as romantic as when me and Lauren were playing that gig on Valentine's Day at that weird pub in St Albans and I sang Lover You Should Have Come Over and Joe Sawyer sat at the front and closed his eyes because earlier we'd talked about Jeff Buckley and basically he's the only boy I've ever met who fully understands me and where I'm coming from. No moment in my life will ever be as embarrassing as when I tried to kiss Sam Lehman and he pulled away from me and I fell over. No moment in my life will ever be as heartbreaking as when Will Young came out as gay and I had to pretend I was fine about it, but I cried while I burned the leather book I was given for my confirmation in which I'd written about our life together. Boys really like it when you say rude things to them and they find it babyish and uncool if you're too nice. When I finally have a boyfriend, little else will matter. Boys For some, the sound that defined their adolescence was the joyful shrieks of their siblings playing in the garden. For others, it was the chain rattle of their much-loved bike hobbling along hills and vales. Some will recall birdsong as they walked to school, or the sound of laughing and footballs being kicked in the playground. For me, it was the sound of AOL dial-up internet. I can still remember it now, note for note, the tinny initial phone beeps, the reedy, half-finished squiggles of sound that signalled a half-connection, the high one note that told you some progress was being made, followed by two abrasive low thumps, some white fuzz, and then the silence indicated that you'd broken through the worst of it. Welcome to AOL, said a soothing voice, the upward inflection on O, followed by, you have email. I would dance around the room to the sound of the AOL dial-up to help the agonising time pass quicker. I choreographed a routine from things I learnt in ballet, a plié on the beeps, a pas de chat on the thumps. I did it every night when I came home from school, because that was the soundtrack of my life, because I spent my adolescence on the internet. A little explanation. I grew up in the suburbs. That's it. That's the explanation. When I was eight years old, my parents made the cruel decision to move us out of a basement flat in Islington and into a larger house in Stanmore the last stop on the Jubilee Line and on the very furthest fringes of North London. It was the blank margin of the city, an observer of the fun rather than a reveller at the party. When you grow up in Stanmore, you're neither urban nor rural. 
I was too far out of London to be one of those cool kids who went to the Ministry of Sound and dropped their G's and wore cool vintage clothes picked up in surprisingly good Oxfams in Peckham Rye. But I was too far away from the Chilterns to be one of those ruddy-cheeked, feral country teenagers who wore old fishermen's jumpers and learnt how to drive their dad's Citroen when they were 13 and went on walks and took acid in a forest with their cousins. The North London suburbs were a vacuum for identity. It was as beige as the plush carpets that adorned its every home. There was no art, no culture, no old buildings, no parks, no independent shops or restaurants. There were golf clubs and branches of prezzo and private schools and driveways and roundabouts and retail parks and glass-roofed shopping centres. The women looked the same, the houses were built the same, the cars were all the same. The only form of expression was through the spending of money on homogenised assets, conservatories, kitchen extensions, cars with inbuilt sat-nav, all-inclusive holidays to Mallorca. Unless you played golf, wanted your hair highlighted, or to browse a Volkswagen showroom, there was absolutely nothing to do. This was particularly true if you were a teenager at the mercy of your mother's availability to cart you around in her aforementioned Volkswagen Golf GTI. Luckily, I had my best friend Farley, who was a three and a half mile bike ride away from my cul-de-sac. Farley was, and still is, different to any other person in my life. We met at school when we were 11 years old. She was, and remains, the total opposite to me. She is dark, I am fair. She's a little too short, I'm a little too tall. She plans and schedules everything. I leave everything to the last minute. She loves order, I'm inclined towards mess. She loves rules, I hate rules. She is without ego. I think my piece of morning toast is important enough to warrant broadcast on social media, three channels. She is very present and focused on tasks at hand. I'm always half in life, half in a fantastical version of it in my head. But somehow, we work. Nothing luckier has ever happened in my life than the day Farley sat next to me in a maths lesson in 1999. The order of the day with Farley was always exactly the same. We'd sit in front of the television eating mountains of bagels and crisps, though only when our parents were out. Another trait of the suburban middle classes is that they are particularly precious about sofas and always have a strictly no eating living room and watching American teen sitcoms on Nickelodeon. When we'd run out of episodes of Sister Sister and Two of a Kind and Sabrina the Teenage Witch, we'd move on to the music channels, staring slack-jawed at the TV screen while flicking between MTV, MTV Bass and VH1 every 10 seconds, looking for a particular Usher video. When we were bored of that, we'd go back onto Nickelodeon Plus One and watch all the episodes of the American teen sitcoms we'd watched an hour earlier on repeat. Morrissey once described his teenage life as waiting for a bus that never came, a feeling that's only exacerbated when you come of age in a place that feels like an all-beige waiting room. I was bored and sad and lonely, restlessly wishing the hours of my childhood away. And then, like a gallant knight in shining armour, came AOL dial-up internet on my family's large desktop computer. And then came MSN Instant Messenger. When I downloaded MSN Messenger and started adding email address contacts, friends from school, friends of friends, friends in nearby schools who I'd never met, it was like knocking on the wall of a prison cell and hearing someone tap back. It was like finding blades of grass on Mars. It was like turning the knob of the radio on and finally hearing the crackle smooth into a human voice. It was an escape out of my suburban doldrums and into an abundance of human life. MSN was more than a way I kept in touch with my friends as a teenager. It was a place. That's how I remember it, as a room I physically sat in for hours and hours every evening and weekend until my eyes turned bloodshot from staring at the screen. Even when we'd leave the suburbs and my parents would generously take my brother and me for holidays in France, it was still the room I occupied every day. The first thing I would do when we arrived at a new B&B was find out if they had a computer with internet, usually an ancient desktop in a dark basement, and I would log on to MSN Messenger and unashamedly sit chatting on it for hours while a moody French teenager sat behind me in an armchair waiting for his go. The Provençal sunshine beat down outside where the rest of my family lay by the pool and read. But my parents knew there was no arguing with me when it came to MSN Messenger. It was the hub of all my friendships. It was my own private space. It was the only thing I could call my own. As I say, it was a place. 
My first email address was munchkin underscore one underscore four at hotmail.com, which I set up age 12 in my school IT room. I chose the number 14 as I assumed I would only be emailing for two years before it became babyish. I gave myself room to enjoy this new fad and its various eccentricities until the address would expire in relevance on my 14th birthday. I didn't start using MSN Messenger until I was 14, and in this space of time would also try out Will Young is Yum at Hotmail.com to express my new passion for the 2002 winner of Pop Idol. I also tried Thespian underscore me at Hotmail.com on for size after giving a barnstorming performance as Mr Snow in the school's production of Carousel. I reprised Munchkin underscore one underscore four when I downloaded MSN Instant Messenger and enjoyed the overflowing MSN Messenger contact book of school friends I had accumulated since the address's conception. But crucially, there was also the introduction of boys. Now, I didn't know any boys at this point, other than my brother, little cousin, dad, and one or two of my dad's cricketing friends. Truly, I hadn't spent any time with a boy in my entire life. But MSN brought the email addresses and avatars of these new floating phantom boys. They were charitably donated by various girls at my school the ones who would hang out with boys at the weekend and then magnanimously pass their email addresses around the student body. These boys did the MSN circuit. Every girl from my school would add them as a contact and we'd all have our 15 minutes of fame talking to them. Where the boys were sourced from broadly fell into three categories. The first, a girl's mother's godson or some sort of family friend on the outskirts of her life who she'd grown up with. He was normally a year or two older than us, very tall and lanky, with a deep voice. Also lumped into this category was someone's schoolboy neighbour. The next classification were the cousins or second cousins of someone. Finally, and most exotically, a boy who someone had met when they were on a family holiday. This was the holy grail, really, as he could be from absolutely anywhere, as far flung as Bromley or Maidenhead. And yet there you'd be, talking to him on MSN Messenger as if he were in the same room. What madness, what adventure. I quickly collated a Rolodex of these waifs and strays, giving them their own separate label in my contacts list, marked boys. Weeks would pass talking to them, about GCSE choices, about our favourite bands, about how much we smoked and drank and how far we'd been with the opposite sex, always a momentously laboured work of fiction. Of course, we all had little to no idea of what anyone looked like. This was before we had camera phones or social media profiles, so the only thing you'd have to go on was their tiny MSN profile photo and their description of themselves. Sometimes I'd go to the trouble of using my mum's scanner to upload a photograph of me looking nice at a family meal or on holiday. Then I'd carefully cut out my aunt or my grandpa using a crop function on paint, but mostly it was too much for faff. The arrival of virtual boys into the world of our school friends came with a whole set of fresh conflicts and drama. There would be an ever-turning rumour mill about who was talking to whom. Girls would pledge their faith to boys they'd never met by inserting the boy's first name into their username with stars and hearts and underscores either side. Some girls thought they were in an exclusive online dialogue with a boy, but these usernames cropping up would tell a different story. Sometimes girls from neighbouring schools who you'd never met would add you to ask straight out if you were talking to the same boy they were talking to. Occasionally, and this would always go down as a cautionary tale in the common room, you would accidentally expose an MSN relationship with a boy by writing a message to him in the wrong window and sending it to a friend instead. Shakespearean levels of tragedy would ensue. There was a complicated etiquette that came with MSN. If both you and a boy you liked were logged on, but he wasn't talking to you, a fail-safe way of getting his attention would be to log off then on again, as he would be notified of your re-entry and reminded of your presence, hopefully resulting in a conversation. There was also the trick of hiding your online status if you wanted to avoid talking to anyone other than one particular contact, as you could do so furtively. It was a complex Edwardian dance of courtship, and I was a giddy and willing participant. These long correspondences rarely resulted in a real-life meet-up, and when they did, they were nearly always a gut-wrenching disappointment. There was Max with the double-barreled surname, a notorious MSN Casanova, known for sending girls baby G watches in the post, who Farley agreed to meet outside a newsagent in Bushy one Saturday afternoon after months of chatting online. She got there, took one look at him and freaked out, hiding behind a bin for cover. 
She watched him call her mobile over and over again from a phone box, but she couldn't face the reality of a meet-up in the flesh and legged it back home. They continued to speak for hours every night on MSN. I had two. The first was a disastrous blind date in a shopping centre that lasted less than 15 minutes. The second was a boy from a nearby boarding school who I'd spoken to for nearly a year before we finally had our first date at Pizza Express, Stanmore. For the following year, we had a sort of on-off relationship, mainly off because he was always locked up at school, but I would occasionally go visit him, wearing lipstick and carrying a handbag full of packets of fags I'd bought for him, like Bob Hope being sent out to entertain the troops in the Second World War. He had no access to the internet in his dormitory, so MSN was out of the question. But we remedied this with weekly letters and long calls that made my father age with despair when greeted with a three-figure monthly landline phone bill. At 15, I began a love affair more all-consuming than anything that had ever happened in the windows of MSN Instant Messenger when I made new friends with a wild-haired girl with freckles and coal-rimmed hazel eyes called Lauren. We'd seen each other around at the odd Hollywood Bowl birthday party since we were kids, but we finally met properly through our mutual friend Jess over dinner in one of Stanmore's many Italian chain restaurants. The connection was like everything I'd ever seen in any romantic film I'd ever watched on ITV2. We talked until our mouths were dry. We finished each other's sentences. We made tables turn round as we laughed like drains. Jess went home and we sat on a bench in the freezing cold after we got chucked out of the restaurant just so we could carry on talking. She was a guitarist looking for a singer to start a band. I'd sung at one sparsely attended open mic night in Hoxton and I needed a guitarist. We started rehearsing bossa nova covers of Dead Kennedy's songs the following day in her mum's shed with the first draft of our band name being Raging Pankhurst. We later changed it to, even more inexplicably, Sophie Can't Fly. Our first gig was in a Turkish restaurant in Pinner with just one customer in the heaving restaurant who wasn't a member of our family or a school friend. We went on to do all the big names, Theatre Foyer in Rickmansworth, a pub garden's derelict outbuilding in Mill Hill, a cricket pavilion just outside of Cheltenham. We busked on any street without a policeman, we sang at the reception of any bar mitzvah that would have us. We also shared a hobby for the pioneering method of multi-platforming our MSN content. Early on in our friendship, we discovered that since the conception of Instant Messenger, we'd both been copying and pasting conversations with boys onto a Microsoft Word document, printing them out and putting the pages in a ring binder folder to read before bed like an erotic novel. We thought ourselves to be a sort of two-person Bloomsbury group of early noughties MSN Messenger. But just as I formed a friendship with Lauren, I left suburbia to live 75 miles north of Stanmore at a co-ed boarding school. MSN could no longer serve my curiosity around the opposite sex. I needed to know what they were like in real life. The ever-fading smell of Ralph Lauren polo blue on a love letter didn't satisfy me anymore, and neither did the pings and drums of new messages on MSN. I went to boarding school to try to acclimatise to boys. Aside, and thank God I did, Farley stayed on for sixth form at our all-girls school, and when she arrived at university, having never spent any time around boys, she was like an uncut bull in a china shop. On the first night of Freshers' Week, there was a traffic light party where single people were encouraged to wear something green and people in relationships wore something red. Most of us took this to mean a green T-shirt, but Farley arrived at our Halls of Residence bar wearing green tights, green shoes, a green dress and a giant green bow in her hair along with a mist of green hairspray. She might as well have had I went to an all-girls school tattooed across her forehead. I'm forever grateful I had two years on the nursery slopes of mixed interaction at boarding school, Otherwise, I fear I too would have fallen foul of the can of green hairspray come fresh as week. As it turns out, I discovered I had absolutely nothing in common with most boys and next to no interest in them unless I wanted to kiss them. And no boy I wanted to kiss wanted to kiss me. So I might as well have stayed in Stanmore and continued to enjoy a series of fantasy relationships played out in the fecund lands of my imagination. I blame my high expectations for love on two things. The first is that I'm the child of parents who are almost embarrassingly infatuated with each other. The second is the films I watched in my formative years. As a child, I had a rather unusual obsession with old musicals, and having grown up absolutely addicted to the films of Gene Kelly and Rock Hudson, I'd always expected boys to carry themselves with a similar elegance and charm, but co-ed school killed this notion pretty fast. Take, for example, my first politics lesson. I was one of just two girls in the class of 12 and had never sat with as many boys in one room in my entire life. The best-looking boy, who I'd already been told was a notorious heartthrob, he 
his older brother who'd left the year before was nicknamed Zeus, passed a piece of paper to me down the table while our teacher explained what proportional representation was. The note was folded up with a heart drawn on the front, leading me to believe it was a love letter. I opened it with a coy smile. However, when I unfolded it, there was a picture of a creature, helpfully annotated to inform me that it was an orc from Lord of the Rings, with You Look Like This scribbled underneath it. Farley came to visit me at the weekends and ogled at the hundreds of boys of all shapes and sizes wandering around the streets, sports bags and hockey sticks flung over their shoulders. She couldn't believe my luck that I got to sit in pews every morning in chapel within reaching distance of them. But I found the reality of boys to be slightly disappointing. Not as funny as the girls I'd met there, not nearly as interesting or kind. And for some reason, I could never quite relax around any of them. By the time I left school, I'd stopped using MSN Messenger as religiously as I once had. My first term at Exeter University swung round, and with it, the advent of Facebook. Facebook was a treasure trove for boys online, and this time, even better, you had all their vital information collated together on one page. I regularly browsed through my uni friends' photos and added anyone who I liked the look of. This would quickly accelerate into messages back and forth and planned meetups at one of the many vodka shark club nights or phone parties happening that week. I was at a campus university at a cathedral city in Devon. Locating each other was no hard task. If MSN had been a blank canvas on which I could splatter vivid fantasies, Facebook messaging was a purely functional meetup tool. It was how students identified their next conquest, lined up their next Thursday night. By the time I left university and returned to London, I'd firmly given up my habit of cold-calling potential love interests on Facebook with the persuasive aggression of an Avon representative, but a new pattern was forming. I would meet a man through a friend or at a party, or on a night out, get his name and number, and then form an epistolary relationship with him over text or email for weeks and weeks before I would confirm a second real-life meetup. Perhaps it was because this was the only way I'd learnt to get to know someone with a distance in between us, with enough space for me to curate and filter the best version of myself possible. All the good jokes, all the best sentences, all the songs I knew he'd be impressed by, normally sent to me by Lauren. In return, I'd send songs to her to pass on to her pen pal. She once commented that we sent good new music to each other at a wholesale price, then passed it on to love interests as our own with an emotional markup. This form of correspondence nearly always ended in disappointment. I slowly began to realise that it's best for those first dates to happen in real life rather than in written form. Otherwise, the disparity between who you imagine the other person to be and who they actually are grows wider and wider. Many times, I would invent a person in my head and create our chemistry as if writing a screenplay. And by the time we'd meet again in real life, I'd be crushingly let down. It was as if, when things didn't go as I imagined, I'd assumed he would have been given a copy of the script I'd written and I'd feel frustrated that his agent obviously forgot to courier it to him to memorise. Any woman who spent her formative years surrounded only by other girls will tell you the same thing. You never really shake off the idea that boys are the most fascinating, beguiling, repulsive, bizarre creatures to roam the earth, as dangerous and mythological as a Sasquatch. More often than not, it also means you're a confirmed fantasist for life, because how could you not be? For years on end, all I did was sit on walls with Farley, kicking the bricks with my thick rubber soles, staring up at the sky, trying to dream up enough to keep us distracted from the endless sight of hundreds of girls walking around us in matching uniform. Your imagination has the daily workout of an Olympic athlete when you attend an all-girls school. It's amazing how habituated you become to the intense heat of fantasy when you escape to it so often. I always thought my fascination and obsession with the opposite sex would cool down when I left school and life began. But little did I know I would be just as clueless about how to be with them in my late twenties as I was when I first logged on to MSN Messenger. Boys were a problem, one that would take me 15 years to fix. The Bad Date Diaries, 12 Minutes the year is 2002. I am 14 years old. I wear a kilt skirt from Miss Selfridge, a pair of black Dot Martins and a neon orange crop top. The boy is Bet Salel, an acquaintance of my school friend Natalie. They met on Jewish holiday camp and have been speaking on MSN and giving each other relationship and life advice ever since. 
Natalie's in the market for new friends, having just lost hers by spreading a rumour that a girl in our year self-harms when actually it's just bad eczema and I'm one of her targets. She knows I want a boyfriend, so suggests she sets Bets and I up on MSN Messenger. I'm more than happy with the unspoken agreement that Natalie gifts me a new boy to speak to and in return I occasionally eat lunch with her. Bets and I are basically going out after a month of speaking with each other every day after school on MSN. He thinks everyone his age is immature, as do I, and he's also tall for his age, as am I. We chew the fat of these shared experiences constantly. We agree to meet in Costa, Brent Cross Shopping Centre. I ask Farley to come so I'm not on my own. Betts arrives and he looks nothing like the photo he sent me. He's shaved all his curly hair off and has put on stacks of weight since camp. We wave at each other across the table. Betts orders nothing. Farley does all the talking while Betts and I stare at the floor, embarrassed, silent. Betts has a shopping bag. He tells us he's just bought Toy Story 2 on video. I tell him that's babyish. He says my skirt makes me look like a Scottish man. I tell him we have to leave because we need to catch the 142 back to Stanmore. The date lasts 12 minutes. When I get home and log on to MSN, Betts immediately sends me a long message I know he's already written on Microsoft Word and copied and pasted into the chat window in his trademark italic purple comic sans. He says he thinks I'm a nice girl, but he doesn't have feelings for me. I tell him it's out of order of him to write a speech and sit at home waiting for me to log on when he lives so near Brent Cross and my bus is 25 minutes from home just because he knows I fancied him less than he fancied me and he didn't want me to say it first. Betts blocks me for a month, but he eventually forgives me. We never have a second meeting, but we become relationship confidants until I'm 17. Free from my contractual obligation, Natalie and I never eat lunch together again. The Bad Party Chronicles, UCL Halls, New Year's Eve, 2006. It's my first holiday home after my first term at university. Lauren, also home for Christmas, suggests we go to a New Year's Eve party in the UCL Halls of Residence. She's been invited by Hayley, a girl she went to school with and hasn't seen since prize giving. We arrive at the large communal flat in a dilapidated building on a back street in between Euston and Warren Street. The party attendees are an even mix of UCL stoners, Lauren's school friends and opportunistic passers-by who see the door open and hear R. Kelly's ignition on repeat for the best part of an evening. Lauren and I have a bottle of red wine each, Jacob's Creek Shiraz, because it's a special occasion, which we drink from two plastic glasses, not the bottle, because it's a special occasion. I scan the room for boys with working limbs and a detectable pulse. I am, at this point, 18 six months into my sexually active life and at a uniquely heightened stage of sexuality, an ephemeral period where sex was my biggest adventure and discovery, a time when shagging was like potatoes and tobacco, and I, Sir Walter Riley. I couldn't understand why everyone wasn't doing it all the time. All the books and films and songs that had ever been written about it were not enough to cover all corners of how great it was. How did anyone see the opportunity in any evening for anything other than having sex or finding someone to have sex with? This feeling had insidiously evaporated by my 19th birthday. I spot a familiar friendly face on a tall body with broad shoulders and quickly identify him as a boy who was the runner on a sitcom I did work experience on after my GCSEs. We'd flirt and bitch about the diva cast members during furtive cigarettes behind the studio. We approach each other now with outstretched arms for a hug and almost immediately start snogging. This is how I operated when my hormones were pumping through my bloodstream so thick and fast. A handshake became a snog, a hug became a dry hump. The social markers of intimacy all climbed up a few steps. After a couple of hours of sharing Shiraz and rubbing up against each other, we lock ourselves in the bathroom to seal the deal. We begin fumbling around each other's respective jeans and skirt, drunken teenagers trying to fix a broken fuse box, when there's a knock at the door. The loo isn't working, I shout, the runner gnawing at my neck. Doll, Lauren hisses. It's me. Let me in. I button up my skirt, move to the door and open it a crack. What? I say, poking my head round. She shuffles in through the gap. So I've been getting off with Finn. She notices my friend in the corner of the bathroom, now sheepishly zipping up his jeans. Oh, hello, she says to him breezily. So I'm getting off with Finn, but I'm worried he's going to feel my knickers. So? 
They're control pants, she says, lifting up her dress to show me a flesh-coloured girdle. Told your stomach and back fat in. Well, just take them off. Pretend you weren't wearing any, I say, pushing her towards the door. Where do I put them? Everyone's in every room. I've been into every room and there are groups in every single one. Put them in here, I say, pointing behind the loose grubby cistern. No one will find them. I help Lauren pull them down her legs. We stuff them behind the loo and I shove her out. Sadly, due to the vast vats of alcohol we've consumed and the shared spliff, the runner can't perform. We make several attempts to remedy the situation, one of which is so frenetic we accidentally unhinge the shower unit from the wall, but all are futile. So we cut our losses and amicably go our separate ways. He leaves for another party and we hug goodbye. It has just gone midnight. Lauren and I reunite in the room where the most marijuana is being smoked to catch up on our respective venery. Finn has also departed for the promise of a better party in the inky black first hours of a new year. We toast the proficiency of friendship and endless disappointment of boys before spotting and swiftly befriending an emo band we've met on the whetstone open mic circuit. She takes the singer with Robert Smith hair, I take the bassist with cabbage patch doll cheeks. We all slouch against a wardrobe, passing silk cuts and spliffs up and down our factory line of four, and taking turns to put our iPods into the speaker dock to play an even mix of John Mayer and Panic at the Disco. The music suddenly stops. Someone has broken the shower, Haley announces imperiously. We need to find the person who broke the shower because they need to pay for it, otherwise we'll get into huge trouble with the warden. Yeah, yeah, we need to find them, I chime in with a slur. I think it was that short guy with the long hair. Which guy? But he was here a moment ago, I say. It was definitely him. He came out of the bathroom with a girl and they were laughing. He's gone outside to have a cigarette, I think. I lead a witch hunt of the hall's residence out into the street to find the made-up man, but quickly lose interest in the decoy when I see Joel, who's looking for the party. Joel is a famous North London heartthrob, a Jewish Warren Beatty with gelled spikes and acne scars, Danny Zuko of the suburbs. I offer him a cigarette, and immediately we're snogging like we're making small talk about TFL. We migrate back into the flat, where I enjoy publicly snogging Joel, a fair few kudos points higher than the runner of yore. I'm only sad that I can't colonise the bathroom once more, now crowded with Haley and her half-baked silent witness team of party pooper forensics, trying to deduce who broke the shower and how. I'm looking for a new hiding place when Christine, a beautiful blonde, the sandy to Joel's Danny, asks if she can have a word with him. I graciously leave them to it because, as the old adage goes, if you want to shag something, let it go. Lauren and I reconvene for a fag. On to the Mayfairs now. They used to go out when we were at school, she tells me. Very up and down, very intense. Oh, I say. I look across the room to see Christine and Joel holding hands and leaving the flat. He waves at me apologetically on his way out. Bye, he mouths. Lauren is preoccupied with the emo singer and they're talking about chord progressions, a sure sign she's committed to the idea of having sex. It's nearly 4am and I need to wake up in two hours to get to my job as a sales assistant at an upmarket Bond Street shoe shop where I'm on 1% commission that I cannot afford to lose. I go in search of a piece of carpet in a darkened room to sleep on and, to my delight, find a vacant single bed and set my alarm for six. Two hours later, I wake up with the worst hangover of my life. My brain feels like it's been turned inside out, my eyes are glued together with mascara, and my breath smells like a Sauvignon swilling rat has crawled into my mouth during the night, died and decayed. I look down at my brown Topshop miniskirt, bare legs and pirate boots, remembering that I haven't brought my work uniform with me. Haley, I hiss prodding her body with my big toe as she sleeps on a pile of jumpers on the floor next to me. Haley, I need to borrow a dress, just a plain black dress. I'll bring it back later today. You're in my bed, she says flatly. You wouldn't get out of it last night. Sorry, I reply. And Lauren told me it was you who broke the shower, she mutters into the jumpers. I say nothing, leave quietly, and regret the altruism I displayed only a few hours earlier in finding a notebook of Haley's sad little poems under her pillow and not reading it cover to cover. You look like a homeless person, my witchy-faced boss Mary snarls at me as I walk into work. You smell like one too. Get down to the stockroom, she says, waving her hand at me dismissively as if batting away a fly. You can't be near customers today.
When I get home that night, after the longest day's work of my life, I log onto Facebook to survey the photographic damage from the night before. There, at the top of my homepage, is a close-up photo of Lauren's enormous knickers loaded by Haley into an album called Lost Property. Everyone from the party is tagged. The caption reads only, Whose pants are these? A Hellraiser heads to Leamington Spa. The first time I got drunk, I was ten. I was a guest at Natasha Bratt's Bar Mitzvah, along with four other lucky chosen girls from our year. In the sun-flooded marquee in their Mill Hill back garden, the wine was flowing and the smoked salmon was circling, the women's hair was blow-dried into aggressively undulating trajectories, their lips a uniform frosted beige. And for reasons I will never understand, all of us girls, clearly prepubescent in our Tammy Girl strapless dresses and butterfly clips in our hair, were given glass after glass of champagne by the catering staff. At first, it just felt like a wave of warmth flushing through my body, my blood sprinting, my epidermis humming. Then, like all the screws in all my joints had been loosened, leaving me as springy and light as just proved dough. And then came the chatting, the funny stories, the dramatic impressions of teachers and parents, the rude jokes, the best swear words. To this day... This three-step progression is still how I experience initial drunkenness. A father-daughter dance to Van Morrison's brown-eyed girl was brought to an abrupt and premature finish when one of the girls, slightly further along than the rest of us, threw herself belly first onto the dance floor and wiggled manically underneath the legs of both parties like a flapping fish out of water. I quickly followed suit before we were both removed and told off by an aggrieved uncle. But the night had only just begun. Flooded with newfound confidence, I decided it was time for my first kiss, followed by my second, his best friend, followed by my third, the first's brother. Everyone got stuck in, swapping and trying out kissing partners as if they were shared puddings at a table. Eventually, the suburban child orgy was broken up and we were all taken to the front room and given black coffee. The door was locked and our parents were called to come pick us up. So unprecedented was the bad behaviour, we were reprimanded a second time by our headmistress on Monday and scolded for representing the school in a bad light. This was often an accusation thrown at me during my scholastic years, and it always struck me as a slightly weak takedown, particularly when I'd never chosen to represent the school, rather my parents had chosen the school to represent me. I was never the same after that night, the contents of which provided enough material to fill the pages of my diaries well into my teens. I had, at far too young an age, got the taste for alcohol. I begged for small diluted glasses of wine at any family event. I'd slurp the sweet throat-catching syrup from the bellies of liqueur chocolates at Christmas in the hope of a hit. At 14, I finally found out where my mum and dad hid the keys to their drinks cabinet and would knock back capfuls of cheap French brandy when they were out of the house, enjoying the warm, woozy haze it pulled over the task of homework. Sometimes I'd rope Farley into my furtive suburban binging. We'd swig at their beefy to gin and refill it with water, then sit cross-legged on the plush carpet and watch Who Wants to Be a Millionaire drunkenly fighting over the correct answer. I have never hated anything as much as I hated being a teenager. I could not have been more ill-suited to the state of adolescence. I was desperate to be an adult, desperate to be taken seriously. I hated relying on anyone for anything. I'd have sooner cleaned floors than be given pocket money, or walked three miles in the rain at night than be given a lift home by a parent. I was looking up the price of one-bedroom flats in Camden when I was 15, so I could get a head start on saving up with my babysitting money. I was using my mum's recipes and dining table to host dinner parties at the same age, forcing my friends round for rosemary roast chicken tagliatelle and raspberry pavlovas with a Frank Sinatra soundtrack, when all they wanted to do was eat burgers and go bowling. I wanted my own friends, my own schedule, my own home, my own money, and my own life. I found being a teenager one big, frustrating, mortifying, exposing, codependent embarrassment that couldn't end fast enough. Alcohol, I think, was my small act of independence. It was the one way I could feel like an adult. All the byproducts of drinking that my friends were hooked on, the snogging, the squealing, the secret swapping, smoking and dancing, were fun, but it was the pertinent adultness of alcohol that I loved the most. I would live out make-believe vignettes of mundane adult life. 
I would confidently wander into local off-licenses and browse the backs of bottles while having pretend conversations into my Nokia 3310 about a casual drinks party this Saturday or a nightmare day in the office or where I left the car. While holding my dog-eared copy of The Female Eunuch, ironically, mainly decorative, I would place myself in the middle of the corridor with an earshot of teachers in the four o'clock rush out of school on a Friday and shout, We still on for dinner, yeah? at Farley. I fancy a full-bodied bottle of red and enjoy the slightly quizzical look on their faces as they passed me. Well, screw you, I would think. I'm doing something you do too. I'm drinking. I'm an adult. Take me fucking seriously. It was only when I went to boarding school at 16 that I really cultivated a habit for hard drinking. My co-ed school was the last of the English boarding schools to have a bar on campus for sixth formers. On Thursdays and Saturdays, through a token system, hundreds of 16 to 18-year-olds descended on a small basement, claimed their two cans of beer and rubbed up against each other on a dark, sweaty dance floor to the sound of Beanie Man and other dance hall legends. My boarding house was, luckily, right opposite the bar, which allowed a swift stumble home come 11 o'clock, where our matron would lay out boxes of pizza for us to drunkenly gobble together. It also meant that our house garden was used as a hedonistic after-hours playground, and half an hour after curfew, my housemistress would strap a pit helmet to her head and go out into the bushes foraging for semi-clothed fumbling pupils, After sending any girl found in the garden up to bed with no pizza and sending the boy back to his house, there was always a wonderful moment when we'd overhear her calling the boy's housemaster from her study. I found your James behind my rhododendron bush with my Emily with his trousers down, she'd say in her broad Yorkshire accent. I've sent him on his way. He should be with you in ten minutes. All the teachers knew we drank before we got to the bar. We'd smuggled bottles of vodka in our suitcases hidden in empty, washed-out shampoo bottles. We had a never-ending supply of Marlborough lights under our mattresses. We covered the scent of our tracks with cheap perfume and menthol gum. When I smoked a spliff and had bloodshot eyes, I'd wet my hair as if I'd just got out of the shower and blame it on the shampoo. The general unspoken rule was, we're trusting you to know your limits, so don't be a dick about it. Drink and smoke, but don't behave badly and don't make it obvious. On the whole, the system worked. There was always the odd kid who took it too far, smashed a chair or tried to hump a young maths teacher on duty, but the rest of us managed to hold it together. The teachers were, on the whole, very respectful of the pupils. They treated us like young adults rather than children. The only years of my adolescence that I enjoyed were the last two spent at boarding school. University is never going to be an ideal place for someone with an unhealthy relationship with booze, but my God, I chose the worst one imaginable the day I submitted a UCAS application to Exeter. Nestled in the green, rolling hills of Devon, Exeter has long been known as a university for half-soaked, semi-literate Hooray Henrys. If you ever meet a middle-aged man who still plays lacrosse, knows every rule to every drinking game, and sings better Latin than English when he's drunk, the chances are he went to Exeter University or the Green Welly Uni, as it was known in the 1980s. I only applied because Farley applied. Farley only applied because it was good for classics, and she liked the seaside. I only went because I didn't get onto the one course I really wanted at Bristol, and my parents told me I had to go to university. To this day, I'm convinced that the three years I spent at Exeter left me more stupid than when I arrived. I did little to no work. I went from being a voracious bookworm to not reading a single page of a book that wasn't a set text, I don't think I even finished one of those. From September 2006 to July 2009, all I did was drink and shag. All anyone did was drink and shag, pausing only briefly to eat a kebab, watch an episode of Eggheads, or shop for a fancy dress out for a lashed of the summer wine-themed pub crawl. Far from being the hub of radical thinking and passionate activism I'd hoped for, it was the most politically apathetic place I'd ever been. During my entire time there, there were only two protests I was aware of. The first, a student body stand against the removal of curly fries from the student union pub's menu. The second, one young woman's petition to have a bridleway built on campus so she could travel to and from her lectures on a pony. I would deeply resent the years of my life wasted at Exeter were it not for the one thing that made the whole sorry experience worthwhile, the women I met. Within the first week, Farley and I found a gang of girls who would become our closest friends. 
There was Lacey, a gobby and gorgeous golden-haired drama student. AJ, a luminous brunette from a strict all-girls school who sang hymns when she got drunk. Sabrina, the charming blonde full of life and wide-eyed enthusiasm. There was South London girl Sophie, red-headed, funny and boyish, always coming round to fix things in our flats. And then there was Hicks. Hicks was our ringleader, a Suffolk-born stig of the dump with a bleach-blonde bob, wild eyes and a cape of shimmery turquoise shadow, long, coltish teenage legs and tits I could identify in a lineup because she had them out so much. I'd never met anyone like her. She was bold and dangerous, quick-witted and daring. Nothing seemed to ever have a consequence when you were with Hicks. It was as if she operated as an empress in her own kingdom, with its own rules, where the night finished at 1pm and the next night began the following afternoon, where an old man you met in a pub would end up as a temporary lodger in your house. She was entirely, wholly, completely present, impossibly glamorous and enviably rock and roll. Her reckless, limitless appetite for a good time set the tone for the following three years. The atmosphere at Exeter was so aggressively laddish and male, I often wonder if it is an explanation for why we behaved the way we did when we were students, whether my all-female group of friends was trying to match that energy with our behaviour. It was a perpetuation of American frat boy culture from the films we'd grown up watching, intersecting with the boorish hierarchical system of public school. We enjoyed group crouching urination behind skips. Farley and I were once caught out and reprimanded for doing this on the outskirts of a graveyard, bare bottoms on show for passing traffic. Fortunately, one of them happened to be a police car. We stole traffic cones which piled up in our living room. We picked each other up and threw each other around on club dance floors. We talked about sex like it was a team sport. We were puffed up on bravado and rodomontade, and we operated with ruthless honesty and zero competition with each other, often boring each other's prospective conquests senseless with long, drunk lectures about how amazing our friend was. In the ramshackle house with the red door in which I lived with AJ, Farley and Lacey, we had a visitor's book for overnight guests to sign on their way out the next morning. There was a defunct 1980s television in the back garden that sat there come rain or shine, slugs that covered our hallway that I'd save one by one after a night out by taking them outside and putting them in a special corner of grass. Lacey later admitted they put pellets down for them but never told me. It was a time of heightened eccentric debauchery, a world where two of my friends stayed up all night dancing before heading to Exeter Cathedral for a Sunday service and warbling hymns while wearing gold lycra. A world where Farley once got up for a 9am lecture to find me and Hicks still downstairs drinking Baileys with a middle-aged cab driver we'd invited in the night before. We were the worst type of students imaginable. We were reckless and self-absorbed and childish and violently carefree. We were broken Britain. In fact, we used to shout it as we walked to pubs. Now, I cross roads and get off tubes a stop early to avoid being in the direct vicinity of the exact type of noisy, silly, self-satisfied exhibitionists that we were. If I ever wanted to gauge the extent of the binge-drinking culture in my group of friends at my university, I only had to see it in the eyes of people who visited. My little brother, Ben, came to stay for a couple of days when he was 17 and was appalled at the half-clothed, barely conscious apparitions he met in the clubs I took him to, taking particular umbrage at an area of one bar nicknamed Legends Corner because only members of the rugby team were allowed to sit there. He later told my parents that his three-day visit to Exeter was one of the main reasons he refused to apply to university and chose to go to drama school instead. Lauren went to read English at Oxford and a few times we did a sort of university exchange programme. She'd get the megabus down to Exeter and knock some brain cells out of her head for a few days with me. I'd return to Oxford with her and wander around the Magdalen Deer Park, imagining an alternate life where I read books and wrote bi-weekly essays and lived in a spire-topped house with no television. On Lauren's first ever visit, it was as if I was teaching her how to be a student. On a night out, I ordered a bottle of five-quid rosé from the bar. OK, she said. Is that just for the two of us? No, that's just for me. I replied, as Lauren looked around at my various friends, all carrying separate bottles of wine and one plastic glass from the bar. We get one each. The following day, lying around on the sofa, eating overpriced, sweet, doughy pizza, she watched her first episode of America's Next Top Model. 
That afternoon, she met the lacrosse player on campus who famously began writing his human geography dissertation in the pub at 2pm on the day it was due in. Lauren said she always went back to Oxford feeling relaxed and refreshed after a much-needed break from her exhausting university experience of intellectual peacocking. After a few days in Oxford, I always returned to Exeter feeling a bit low and ready to leave. When illustrating the bubble of unanswered bad behaviour with no punishment that was my university experience, I often returned to a particular anecdote involving Sophie, now a successful and respected journalist covering crucial LGBTQ and women's issues, to remember how far we've come. One night, having left a Thai full moon party at a quayside club, dressed as a Thai fisherman, she lay by the water next to a pissing male friend, thinking she was about to vomit on account of the eight-shot bucket of vodka sharks she'd just purchased and consumed. To her side was a half-comatose friend of a friend who was lying on her back like a starfish. Sophie spotted an opportunity, both to take a young woman back to safety and to potentially get lucky. But once she got to the girls' halls of residence, it was clear this wasn't on the cards, so she got another cab back to the club where she ordered another bucket of vodka shark. She then met a boy who said he was heading to a local late-hours curry house for a takeaway. Sophie went with him, chanting, Persan de, Persan de, while banging on the shop counter. They ordered their food, went to his house, and ate a mountain of curry. Sophie was sick into a perspex bowl in the boy's bedroom and left it on the side. She passed out in his bed, woke up the next morning in her fisherman's costume, glanced at the vomit bowl but did nothing about it and then took the boy's micro-scooter and gleefully scooted all the way home. We were just trying to collect stories for each other, she tells me now, whenever I question how we could all have had such an infantile appetite for recklessness and such little self-awareness. That's what we traded in. It wasn't to show off to anyone else but each other. It was obvious that while everyone loved drinking, I really loved drinking. I down booze at breakneck speed. A lot of it was simply that I loved the taste and sensation of booze, but I also drank as a student for the same reason I drank on my own at 14. Pouring alcohol into my brain was like pouring water into squash. Everything diluted and mellowed. The girl who was sober was riddled with anxieties, convinced everyone she loved was going to die, fretting about what everyone thought of her. The girl who was drunk smoked a cigarette with her toes for a laugh and cartwheeled on dance floors. I graduated from Exeter a month before my 21st birthday, and come September I was a student in London studying for a master's in journalism. This was, believe it or not, the year in which my partying peaked. I'd been unceremoniously and brutally dumped, and I threw myself into weight loss to sidetrack myself from heartbreak, and I drank and smoked for the distraction. I still hadn't lost the taste for it. It was just as exciting at 21 as it had been at Natasha Bratt's bat mitts for 11 years earlier. I remember sitting on the tube on one of many Saturday nights that year, looking out on the glittering city as I journeyed from the suburbs to central London on the Metropolitan Line that rode like a cantering horse on the tracks. All of London is mine, I thought. Anything is possible. My hedonism this year came to a head in a particularly unrock and roll way, a long journey in a minicab. In my defence, Hick started it. In our third year of university, she became a household name amongst the student body of Exeter when she left a night out at a bar on the high street, got into a taxi and asked the driver to take her to Brighton. She spent every penny she had getting there and stayed on the floor of a hotel suite with her married friends who were there on a romantic getaway. She returned to Exeter the following week to tell the tale. The night began when me and my new curly-haired clever friend from my journalism MA course, Helen, went to our friend Moya's house for a glass of wine and to talk through our revision for a big exam we had coming up. Helen and I proceeded to drink bottle after bottle of wine in the sun, getting steaming drunk, leaving Moya's at midnight. I decided the night wasn't over and that I wanted a party, so we got on a bus from West Hampstead to Oxford Circus. However, I became suddenly much drunker the minute the bus journey began, which also took an unfeasibly long time due to a road accident. So at some point whilst in transit, I managed to convince myself that we weren't on a bus to Oxford Circus, but were in fact on a coach to Oxford City Centre. Helen, rendered similarly to me, went along with my persuasive theory. Lauren had graduated from Oxford at this point, so I didn't call her. Instead, I texted a few of her friends who I'd met on my visits there who I knew were in their final year. 
The messages were barely comprehensible, but they went along the lines of, Me and my friend Helen have accidentally got on a coach to Oxford. We're nearly there. Where is good for a night out and would you like to join us? We alighted near the flagship top shop, which I noted was larger than I had remembered the last time I visited Oxford. We stood outside the shop while I incessantly rang anyone I'd ever met from Oxford University, still not taking in that I was in London, but no cigar. Helen and I agreed the night out was a lost cause, but it was too late for me to get the last tube back to my parents' house in the suburbs, so we got another bus back to the Finsbury Park flat that Helen shared with her boyfriend, and she said I could sleep on their sofa. Refusing to let go of my inebriated hallucination, when stepping into the flat I concluded that we were in Oxford University halls, that a friend of Helen's was still a student here perhaps. Helen went to bed, and I scrolled through my phone book to see if anyone I knew would be up for a party. I rang my friend Will. He was a tall, wild, wiry Canadian, with long curly hair and eyes as pale as opals. I'd always had a gigantic crush on him. Hello, darling, he slurred in his vodka-soaked voice. I want a party, I said. Come here, then. Where are you? I asked. Aren't you still at uni in Birmingham? Warwick, I'm living in Leamington Spa, he said. I'll text you the address. I wandered out of Helen's flat and went looking for a cab firm. After ten minutes of roaming the streets, the alcohol slowly leaving my system as I finally just about grasped I was in London and not Oxford, I found a small wooden-fronted minicab company. I announced that I wanted a car to take me to Leamington Spa, and money was absolutely no object, except it had to be £100 or less, as that's all I had in my account and I was at the limit of my overdraft. One of the three bemused men went behind the glass partition to take a dusty map of England out from his drawer. He unfolded the map and theatrically spread it across two tables, pushed together, much to the amusement of his colleagues. They all huddled around it as one planned the journey with dashes marked with a red pen, as if he were the captain of a ship plotting an attack on pirates. Even in my drunken state, I thought it to be a touch over the top. £250, he finally declared. That's ridiculous! Ridiculous, I said with pearl-clutching middle-class customer rights outrage, as if he were the one posing the most absurd request out of the two of us. Lady, you want to go somewhere three counties away at three o'clock in the morning. £250 is a very reasonable price. I got him down to 200 Will said he'd pay for the other 100 I started sobering up on the M1 at around 4am. There's a sentence I hope none of the rest of you ever have to say or write down in all your remaining days. But it was too late to turn back. How I often felt in the middle of these small-hour adventures, convincing myself that this was just getting my money's worth out of my youth. A Margaret Atwood quote hung over this period of my life like a lampshade from the ceiling. When you're in the middle of a story, it isn't a story at all, but only a confusion, a dark roaring, a blindness, a wreckage of shattered glass and splintered wood, like a house in a whirlwind, or else a boat crushed by the icebergs or swept over the rapids, and all aboard powerless to stop it. It's only afterwards that it becomes anything like a story at all, when you are telling it to yourself or to someone else. It would pay off in the end, I thought while I stuck my head out of the window on the motorway, the sky turning to dawn. The anecdotal mileage in this will be inexhaustible. I arrived at half five in the morning, Will greeted me at the door with five twenty-pound notes. I felt triumphant that I'd managed to get there. The journey and the destination were the story. What unfolded was almost irrelevant. We stayed up drinking, talking, and lay in bed half-clothed, smoking weed and listening to Smith's albums, stopping only briefly for some half hour snogging. We fell asleep at 11am. I woke up at 3pm with a terrible headache and a terrible sense that the punchline to the joke wasn't as funny as I thought it had been the night before. I checked my bank account. Zero. I checked my phone. Dozens of worried messages from friends. I'd forgotten I'd sent Farley a photo of me gleefully smiling in the back of the cab at four in the morning while hurtling down the motorway with the message, quick trip to the West Midlands. I made a plan. My teenage boyfriend, who I'd retained a vague friendship with, was training to be a doctor at Warwick Uni. I could stay with him for a few days until some overdue money came through from my weekend job as a promo girl and get a train home in time for my journalism MA exam on Tuesday. But when I texted him, he told me he was away on holiday. 
My phone rang. It was Sophie. Is it true you're in Leamington Spa? She asked when I picked up. Yes. Why? Because I wanted an after party and my friend Will was having one and he lives in Leamington Spa. Will, still half asleep, gave a closed eye smile and a guilty as charged thumbs up. Okay, that doesn't make any sense, she said. How are you going to get home? I don't know. I was going to stay with an old boyfriend, but he's not here and I don't have any money for the train. There was a long pause and I could hear Sophie's concern for me morph into irritation. Right, well, I'll book you a bus home then, she said. Is your phone charged? Yes. I'll send you the details once it's done. Thank you, thank you, thank you, I said. I'll pay you back. Sophie booked me a seat on the longest coach journey she could find, her plan being that I needed some sobering time with just my thoughts so I could contemplate the consequences of my actions. Much to her annoyance, I ended up on a coach with a raucous London-bound hen party. We all did shots of tequila on the journey and they gave me a sombrero to wear. The next day, when I phoned to thank Sophie for saving the day, I asked her if she was annoyed with me. Dolly, she said, I'm not annoyed with you, I'm worried about you. Why? I asked. Because you were so drunk you thought you were in Oxford City Centre when you were outside the Oxford Circus top shop. Do you know how vulnerable that makes a person, wandering around London that drunk? I'm sorry, I said petulantly. I was just having fun. How many of our friends need to bankrupt themselves getting taxis across Britain before this madness stops? It would take just one more. Farley, a few months later, from southwest London to Exeter. She was in a cab going back from a club when she got a text from a boy she fancied, who was still at university, and she asked the driver if he could turn round and go instead to Devon. To this day, she shrugs off accusations of extravagance and says the entire journey cost £90 and a packet of fags. The figure has incrementally climbed in value the more we probe her on it. But they were all good stories, and that's what mattered. It was the raison d'etre of my early twenties. I was a six-foot human metal detector for fragments of potential anecdotes, crawling along the earth of existence, my nose pressed to the grass in hopes of finding something to dig at. Another night, with twenty pounds between us, Hicks and I went to a posh London hotel as she'd promised that it was a hotbed for bored millionaires with buckets of booze who want the company of fun young people. Sure enough, we found two middle-aged men from Dubai who respectively owned a curry house on Edgware Road and one of those English-language universities above a mobile phone shop on Tottenham Court Road. Hicks and I did our old routine of flamboyantly telling the well-rehearsed, made-up story of how we met on a cruise. I was singing with the band, her husband had thrown himself overboard, and we'd started talking one day when we were both sitting alone on the top deck, smoking and looking out to sea. They asked if we fancied heading to their friend Rodney's house, who they assured us was a party boy, the universal euphemism for generous with his alcohol and drugs. We all piled into their car waiting outside, and their driver took us to a tower block on Edgware Road, which was far from the Studio 54 promise of excess and glamour we had been sold. Hicks and I held hands as we walked to the entrance, and in the lift I sent Farley a text with the address of where we were in case anything happened to me that night, a rather morbid ritual she'd got quite used to. A Cypriot man in his mid-seventies wearing stripy pyjamas opened the door. My God! he shouted as he looked us over. It's too late! He threw his hands in the air in despair. I'm too old for this! Our two new friends promised it wouldn't be too long a party and that we just wanted a few drinks. Rodney graciously invited us in and asked what we wanted to drink. He said cocktails were his speciality, while gesturing at his well-stocked 1970s drinks cabinet. I asked for a dry martini. I was quite fascinated by Rodney, particularly by the dozens of framed photographs of grandchildren that were scattered on every available surface. We walked around with our martinis, him still in his pyjamas, and he gave me the names, ages and character descriptions of all of them. Meanwhile. Hicks was doing what she always did on nights like this, earnestly talking about philosophy with one of the Dubai millionaires, gesticulating dramatically while monologuing about French existentialists, her eyes popping out of her head like forget-me-nots springing from cracks in the pavement. Rodney and I sat on his sofa, 
and he told me the mythology of his past, the failed business ventures, the bar he owned that was now Waitrose, the models who broke his heart. He paused from his storytelling at one point, rolling up a five-pound note for the coke he had lined up on his coffee table, and sat back to look at me. You know, it's funny. You remind me so much of a woman I met a few times in the 70s. Long blonde hair, she had eyes just like yours. She was dating a friend of mine,